I'm, I'm very happy to be back here. Um, we, were, we were talking about it. This is my seventh uh, visit to the uh, Frisco Historic Park. Have any of you heard me speak before? I know you have. <laughs> okay, well, great. Um, this is a new program that uh, I'm presenting for the first time here at, at the Frisco Historic Park, and I'm very, very happy about it. So who was the sculptor in buckskin? Some people would call him independent, driven. Many would later call him one of the finest animal sculptors in the world. Maybe you can remember back when you were a little kid, picked up a pencil or some crayons and you might have drawn a horsey or a kitty or a dog or a window to the world. Alexander Themister Proctor didn't put his pencil down unless it was to pick up his hunting rifle. I'd like to introduce you to a man that was so much more than a sculptor. He was a devoted husband, a loving father and grandfather. He also loved the West and he would say many times, my pioneer hunting and fishing days in Colorado are the or are among the most cherished part of my life, which has been really interesting, picturesque, and happy. That's what we're going to talk about today. More about his life. You'll see some of his art and some of his sculptures, but not all of them by any stretch. But that's what we'll be talking about. How many of you can remember the movie Paint Your Wagon? Lee Marvin sang a song, I was born under a wandering star. And that reminds me very much of Femister Proctor. Okay. okay, I know, I know. Clint Eastwood and Lee Marvin singing, really? <laughs> but we're not going to go there. So. But um, um, Alexander Femister Proctor was born in 1860 in Ontario, Canada. Uh, when he was about four years old, the family moved to Michigan. He was the uh, fourth of 11 children in, in that family. They moved from Michigan to Iowa. He went to the Iowa State Fair. He heard Horace Greeley speak. And he heard Horace Greeley say that famous line, Go West, young man, go West. It meant a lot to him. It really did. It burned it into his image. Well, his parents and the family um, moved when he was about 11 years old to the Denver area, just about this time in, in downtown Denver. His father, Alexander Sr., was a tailor. And so he, he moved and set up shop in, in Denver to make clothes for people. Uh, they, they lived about 12th and Glenarm, right downtown in the heart of Denver. But, you know, at that time, that was because that was all there was to Denver. It wasn't very big at the time. Okay? Alexander Proctor, he was only, uh, when he was 11, it was 1871. Well, you know, Denver was only basically established in 1858, so, so there wasn't much to it. But they were about uh, 12th and Glenarm downtown. Okay? <coughs> Please, excuse me. Um, but by the time Proctor was 12, and, and you will hear me call Alexander Finn, Mr. Proctor by uh, his last name, everybody called him Proctor, or Fim for short, but uh, by the time he was about 12, his father purchased some horses, horses and a wagon finally, and they wanted to go on vacation. They'd heard of this place up in the mountains of Colorado called Grand Lake. How many of you have visited Grand Lake? A couple, some of you haven't. Well, it's about two hours from here in Frisco. It's the west entrance to now Rocky Mountain National Park. But again, in the 1870s, there wasn't anything there. It was basically two ruts through the weeds for a wagon trail. It took them almost two weeks just to get from Denver to Grand Lake. We now do that on the paved roads in about an hour and 45 minutes. Okay. But it, uh, they decided they wanted to go visit this Grand Lake and see what it was. They ended up spending the whole summer up there. They were actually the very first family to spend the summer in the small area called Grand Lake. Uh, a gentleman was there that had gotten there in 1867, Joseph Westcott. You'll see his cabin a little bit later on. And uh, he let the, the proctor stay in a, in a kind of a shack that he had next door to his cabin and old Avery. And that was it. That was the only people there for the whole summer that year. 
Okay? It's a little bit different than that now, but, but Proctor met these gentlemen and they would become lifelong friends. And you're going to hear me say that a whole bunch of times because I don't think Mr. Proctor met anybody that he didn't consider a friend for the rest of his life. I really don't think, I've never read of anybody that he didn't like a lot. So. But the next year when he, he was 13, his father decided that he had some artistic talent. So he allowed him to start studying a little bit of artwork and wood engraving and that type of stuff. But Proctor really didn't like it because he had to work to raise the 50 cents to pay for the art lessons. And the art lessons were on Saturdays and holidays. Well, that interrupted his baseball playing and chasing jackrabbits around the fields, what would become later downtown Denver. But, you know, he, he dealt with it. He also found a gentleman downtown Denver. He was working for the Rocky Mountain News newspaper downtown Denver as an engraver into wood. They would engrave a negative on wood and put it on the printing press, and that's how the pictures came to be in the newspaper and then in other articles and magazines and stuff. Well, they found John Harrison Mills. Mills um, was already a, a, a very famous artist. Uh, he had moved to Denver just before that. But back east, uh, John Harrison Mills was in charge of, of uh, sketching President Lincoln on his deathbed, and they turned that into a, a bust that they could sell. And so John Harrison Mills was very well known. Proctor's father introduced him. He worked in this building up on the top floor, way in the back. This is the Rocky Mountain News building uh, at that time. Um, and he took Proctor under his wing and started teaching him some of this wood engraving and, and that kind of stuff. I'd like to uh, read a quote that Mills said. This was uh, about 15 years later, but he was quoted as saying, when he came to my loft studio, I said, if you're going to be an artist, you will need a worthwhile job in artistic illustration to rely upon for a living. I will teach you wood engraving first. Thus began my 10-year mentorship with young Proctor until I moved back to New York in 1885. He continued on by saying, I have become quite proud of my earlier years of mentorship. Proctor will become recognized as America's finest sculptor of American or Western American sculptures. Kind of impressive. He met him when Proctor was 14 years old. Okay. While Proctor was working there, he was introduced to a number of influential people in the Denver area because everybody would come by to see John Mills. Uh, he was introduced to a gentleman by the name of Frederick Dahlenbaugh. Frederick Dahlenbaugh was an artist who had studied in Munich, but he was on the tour with John Wesley Powell when he floated down the Colorado River in 1869 and did all those uh, sketches of the Grand Canyon and, and so forth. So he was one of the people. Um, but he became very interested in, in young Proctor and his work. He saw a lot of talent in this young man, and, and he would encourage him to continue with it. Uh, another gentleman that um, uh, met while the, he was at Mills, the, this is John Harrison Mills, but while he was at his studio, he met another gentleman that also happened to be the pastor at, at his local church. His name was William Baird Craig. Baird Craig, uh, as I mentioned, was the, the pastor at a church in Denver, and he got to know Proctor as a young boy at church, and he knew his older brother also. Well, Craig also had heard of Grand Lake, but had never visited Another year went by and the family went to Grand Lake again, but they left Proctor and his older brother George for the summer. The family went back to Denver and the two boys got to stay there in Grand Lake with, with Avery and, and Judge Westcott, as he was called, and, and a couple other people that had, had built small shacks of cabins by then. And the, he went out and borrowed a gun from Judge Westcott and he went out and he shot a deer. This was just a buck for food so they could cut it up and, and have food. But he found when they started cutting it up to section it for the food, Proctor found that he was running his hands along the muscles and the internal organs of this deer. And he started sketching them. 
He started scribbling down what he was finding, and it would become very important in the rest of his life. However, he did write that it's, he said, it had been the most important event of my young life because he was only 14. I'm going to show you some sketches. All the rest of the sketches that you will see uh, this afternoon are done by uh, Femister Proctor. Uh, this next sketch, he was 16. It talks of a story about him going back to Grand Lake that summer with his older brother George, and the older men went to go hunting, again to provide meat. And Proctor was back at the cabin because he couldn't go because the older men were going to go up the mountain and, and everything. And so he stayed back at the cabin. Well, the, the old gun that he had had from, from Judge Westcott, he said, you know, I think I'll go hunting on my own. So he wandered about a half mile from the cabin and he saw a few elk. And he said, you know what? I'll bet if I shoot a big bull elk, that'll provide a lot of meat, but those guys will be impressed that I could do this when I'm only 16. So he took aim at an elk and he fired, and the gun didn't fire. Mm -hmm. It was a muzzle loading gun. He reloaded it and he fired again, and he hit a bull elk with it. Just enough to really upset it. <laughs> so the elk started walking toward him, and pretty soon the elk was running toward him, and Proctor was running the other way, trying to reload this gun to get another shot off. He tripped and fell into this thicket of trees just before the elk attacked him. He was able to reload the gun, fire it, and, and kill the elk right there. Okay. So now what do I do? He took out his wonderful dull knife, and said, I can't carry this thing. It weighs over 1,000 pounds, so I'm going to cut it up. I'll cut the head off first. So he started whacking away at the, at the neck of the elk to try and take the, the uh, head and antlers back. Found even then it was way too big and too bulky for him to carry. He didn't get very far, and he tripped and went down into a gully with it, and this thing was basically laying on top of him. And he heard some noises, and he crawled up out of this little ditch that he was in, and found that a grizzly bear had apparently smelled the meat of the elk. And said, whoa, thanks, here's dinner. I can enjoy this. He said, what do I do now? Well, you know, I've always thought about shooting a bear. So he reloaded his gun, and he shot at the grizzly bear. And the same thing happened. He hit the bear in the shoulder, and it really upset him. And the bear started chasing him. He found some downed logs. He was able to, to reload the gun, and he finally killed the bear after three shots. Sixteen years old. He goes back to the cabin, and the guys are coming back with, you know, a, a couple of grouse and a small deer that they'd got. And he started bragging about this elk and bear that he had shot that day. And they said, yeah, right. Okay. They didn't want to believe him, but the next morning um, they took their pack mules out and less than a half mile from the cabin they found the elk and less than 30 feet away was the grizzly bear. They were amazed. Okay? And of course it supplied meat for them for a lot of the summertime. The next year he was back down in the Denver area. This is his high school picture when he was 17 years old. A few things changed and, and he grew up just a little bit from there. And this is the the probably the most reproduced and the, and the most popular picture of Proctor that I've ever seen. You've already seen it. Um, this is him in his, his buckskin. Uh, he was 20 when this picture was taken. Fine looking young man. But uh, he would study animals by watching them in action and helping his artwork. He found that if he'd watch an animal moving, he could close his eyes tight, open them for a split second, and close them back and do that several times, and he could remember the animal in motion and the muscle structure and how it worked. And his sketches all represented that for the rest of his life. They really did. I'm going to read several times to you today from his autobiography. Um, he stated a, a number of different things, but he talked about his life. He said, although I was happy working with paints and paper and brushes and pencils, town life irked me, and I was ever lured by the great outdoors. One of my boyhood ambitions was to be a great hunter, 
as well as a productive sculptor and painter. Hmm. He went on a trip. He had met, uh, on one of his return trips from Grand Lake toward Denver, he had met a gentleman who had also been out painting in the woods in Colorado. His name was Alden Sampson. They again became very, very close friends because they shared the artistic nature of, of the outdoors. And uh, he and Alden Sampson became very close. Well, Alden Sampson uh, and Proctor went to Grand Lake one summer. And Proctor was about 24 now. They couldn't find anything to paint. Now yeah, we've seen all this. It's more mountains and more trees. Let's go for a walk. So they took off and, and I said walk, but realistically they were on horseback. They ended up in Yosemite. They just went on an adventure for the summer. They went over to Yosemite and they started drawing and, and sketching some different sites and, and animals and everything else. Well, they came across Half Dome at Yosemite and at the bottom of Half Dome, they found a pile of wire cable. This is the cable that people had put up to help you hold on to as you climbed Half Dome. They found out by talking to people that an avalanche had occurred the year before and had knocked that cable down. Well, being 24, he said, why don't we put it back? So unbeknownst to anybody else that was camped there, he and Alden Sampson got some string and rope together and they started climbing the half dome and putting the cable back up through the little, the little rings that were stuck in the wall, in the rock, okay? But they got so far and some of the pins were missing. So Proctor was climbing this and he would lean back and with his lasso throw his rope up high enough to catch the next one and pull on it several times to see if it would hold him and then he'd pull himself up. But the only way that he could hold on to the wall was to grab these pins this is what the pins look like, and he would grab this pin sticking out of the rock, pull himself up on top of it, and stand on his hand, and then yank his fingers out real quick, and grab the pin with his foot until he couldn't find out, he didn't have enough traction with his shoes, so he took his shoes off. So he could grab this pin with his toes. And that's how he climbed all of Half Dome. He had a string fastened to his belt, and it had a rope, and it was attached to the cable, and one by one by one by one, they spent two days on the side of Half Dome restringing it. They got all done. They were up on top of the mountain, and they lit a fire to say, wow, we're going to celebrate. The people down in the valley, down below Half Dome, said, oh my goodness, somebody's in trouble. They've lit a fire up there. We've got to go, we've got to go rescue them. So they started gathering a search party to, to go rescue whoever was in trouble up there. Well, Alden Sampson and Proctor, they'd already climbed down the cable. They were wandering around, what's, what's the problem? What's going on? They said, we're going up there to rescue people. They said, no, that was us. It was a very important time in Proctor's life. It really was. Um, I'm going to read from his autobiography again because this is what he said about it. He said, there are times in a young, young man's life that a great experience changes it. Those two days on Half Dome were for me the divide between careless youth and serious manhood. My mind had been made up long ago to become an artist. There was nothing else for me in the way of a profession. But I returned to Denver and was soon launched upon the career that has claimed me ever since. So when he was 24, that same summer when they got back from Yosemite, he did this self-portrait. Okay. He went back to Grand Lake in the summer of 1885, and he purchased some land. He, he purchased 106 acres along the shore of Grand Lake. It was through the Homestead Act, but you, he didn't homestead it. He, he did an actual purchase of it. And he paid $1.25 per acre on the shorefront of, of uh, Grand Lake and called it his homestead because he, he did it as part of the homestead, as I said. And he had a little cabin there, a little shack outside. We don't think the shack really existed, but he painted a picture. The, the uh, uh, picture that you see here, this is Mount Baldy near the end of Grand Lake. And, um, but he 
just sketched out his little cabin. But he wanted to continue his art studies, and for that he needed money. So he turned around and later that same year, turned around and sold that property, property for a profit. He paid $137 for it. He turned it around and sold it to his friend Bayard Craig out of Denver for $150 so that he could go to New York and start his art studies. Bayard Craig took the lot, it was 106 acres, and he said, I'm going to start dividing this up and selling it in lots. It, this is lakefront property. He didn't call it that at the time, but that's what it is. And so he started dividing it up a little bit, made a lot of money doing that. Bayard Craig was a financial genius. He was very wealthy when he came to Denver. He opened a church. He built a church out of his pocket. He put the money up for the church. He built seven churches in Denver eventually. But he took his profits from the selling of the land in Grand Lake and he went a little further west in Colorado and found two other investors and they found an area and they said this would be a perfect little town. We're going to name it Steamboat Springs. Well, he invested in Steamboat Springs and that made him even more money. So he continued a little further west and opened another town all by himself that he invested in and it's now named after him, Craig, Colorado. All from the profits on his land that he bought from Fenister Proctor in Grand Lake for $150. Okay. Well, Proctor did finally start uh, to go to New York. This, uh, uh, that same year, uh, this is his brother, his older brother, George, with Proctor on the left there. Uh, again, the buckskin is what they wore when they were out hunting and, and wandering around. But he wanted to still continue to go to New York and be famous and learn more art. He needed a sampling. So this is the first painting that we have been able to find that he ever did. 24 years old, this is his first elk painting, again by memory. Okay. He was able to sell that painting for another $30, believe it or not. Okay. He went to New York to start his studies. He said, at last, I'm where the best of everything can be had. Okay. He started in the, um, in the Art Students League in New York. This is Proctor with his back to you on the lower stool there, uh, just doing some artwork there. And he was doing some painting and sketching, but he was also doing some of his sculpting. He was starting to play around with clay. A, a, a famous man by the name of John Rogers came in, who was already a, a very well-known sculptor at the time. And he came in and said, you're doing great work. Keep it up. You've got to keep doing this. So he did. He did the little fawn, okay. all from his sketches. But look at the muscles of that baby deer, the little fawn. Another gentleman came into New York and came into the Art Students League, Frederick Dallenbaugh, that he had met a couple years before. He saw this and he said, you're doing great work. He actually got him a showing and did some commissions for him. But he, was, he had a showing of the little fawn and some of his sketches at the Century Club in New York. And there he was introduced to another man by the name of Frank Millay. This gentleman would later help him with his first major commission. And you'll hear about that in just a little while ago. Okay. But as usual in the summer of 1888, he went back to the mountains of Colorado. He was going hunting. He took some time off. Back in New York, he met another gentleman. His name was Harry Stimson. They became lifelong friends. I told you I, that you were going to hear that. He really was. Uh, Henry Stimson, he, uh, he went to Stimson's father's house and spent a lot of time there and, and with Henry Stimson. The last time Proctor visited Grand Lake was in 1889 with Henry Stimson. They went hunting together. Um, they went on a hunting trip and... and Stimson was loving the mountains. He said, I want to see more of the outdoors. Henry Stimson would later become, and I've got to read all of it to you, he would serve as the Secretary of War under Presidents Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman. In that position, Henry Stimson oversaw the entire Manhattan Project. He would later serve as Secretary of State under President Herbert Hoover. Good friend of Proctor's. Not only was he lifelong friends with people, he found influential people, okay? 
Well, Proctor took off in 1891 and 1892, both of those summers. His family, his parents and siblings, had moved to Snohomish, Washington, just outside of Seattle, and he went to visit them for a couple years. Spent some time out in the Cascades drawing and sketching and, and looking. He wrote that he spent another happy summer sketching and hunting in the Cascades. In the fall of 1891, on his return trip to New York, he got a telegram. It was inviting him to do some work at the Columbian Exhibition of 1893 in Chicago, the Chicago World's Fair as we know it. Okay? This would be his first big commission. He arrived in Chicago on September 27, 1891 happened to be his 31st birthday. Frank Millay, whom he'd met a few years earlier, was now the director of external exhibits for the Columbian Exhibition. And he hired Proctor to do some outdoor sculptures. He eventually did 37 for the Columbian Exhibition. He started with something he had never seen. He had seen pictures of it. But he did some outdoor sculptures of a moose or two. For, not, for never seeing the animal, I think he didn't do bad, okay? He also did a cowboy riding a horse. He also did a, a warrior, it was called, on the war trail. <laughs> these statues for the Columbian Exhibition, these were all done out of what they would call staff. They weren't made to last very long. Staff is kind of a mixture of plaster and paper over a wire framework. I mean, they were there to last during the World's Fair and that was it. Okay, then they were going to do away with them. But uh, these two, the Indian and the cowboy on the horse, the previous one, did last quite a while. When the Columbian Exhibition was over, the city of Denver paid to have those two moved and be put downtown in their brand new Civic Plaza area that they were going to develop. They were falling apart, <laughs> but they lasted for a while. In 1892, while he was at the Columbian Exhibition, he was, he was asked to attend a luncheon at the Boone and Crockett uh, Club for hunters. There, he met the president of the club, his name was Teddy Roosevelt. Proctor became friends with Teddy Roosevelt through this luncheon. And Proctor was actually had some of his later uh, hunting uh, animals that were accepted into the Boone and Crockett. He, for a long, long time, he held three records in the Boone and Crockett Club. Just on and on and on. With all that he had done over a year and a half at the exhibition, the best thing he said that ever came out of that exposition was Margaret Daisy Giroux. She was helping another sculptor. She was a painter and, and she was helping another sculptor, sculptor that had a booth right next to where Proctor was doing his work. So they'd walk by each other all the time, every now and then, you know. They were too busy to really get to know each other. Finally, he broke down and asked her out on a date. It probably lasted 15 minutes to go get a Coke or something. But it, it was a wonderful experience for him. And finally, after several months, he asked her to marry him. And she said yes. Okay. So at the end of the exposition, um, they got married. They got married on September 27th, 1893, his 33rd birthday. Just after her 18th birthday. Okay. But Proctor was headed to France to study sculpture, study more art. It was great because Margaret knew French and Proctor didn't. So after their quick honeymoon up by uh, Niagara Falls that he sketched out for them, okay, they took off for France almost immediately. Their, their honeymoon was three days long and they caught the ship for France. Now I don't speak French, so I probably am going to pronounce it wrong, so would you say the Academy Julian? Okay, this is where he went to study. He had received a scholarship uh, for his first year to go over there and, and start studying. He got into it, and immediately he, he got an email, or a cablegram, an email. <laughs> Excuse me, in 1894, it was actually a cablegram because it went under the ocean. But it said, will you come to New York to do a model of the horse for my equestrian statue of General Logan for Chicago? 
It was from another artist, another sculptor that he had met at the Chicago exhibition by the name of Augustus St. Gaudens, one of the world's most famous sculptors at the time. But he liked Proctor's animals. He said, I'll do the general, but will you come and do the horse for me? That much respect for him, from him. Okay? So they packed and left Paris immediately. Okay? They went back to Chicago and they worked on, on the statue with the Sigoudens and then went back to Paris to study more. Okay? Well, I, I'm sorry? Is he getting paid for some of this? Oh, you bet. Yeah, he got paid for this horse. He got paid for the uh, statues at the exposition. Okay? Um, but he went back to Paris and St. Gowden said, well, you know, I've got another one coming up. Will you come back to the States and do the horse for General William Tecumseh Sherman for me? So he did. And did that horse. Okay? So that was 1895. In 1895 also, he took the summer off because Teddy Roosevelt and Henry Stimson had gotten together. They were going to go on a trip to Montana to look at a site for a new national park, and they invited Proctor to go along to go hunting with them also. So the three of them, Teddy Roosevelt, Henry Stimson, and Proctor, went to Montana together to go hunting. While there, Proctor met some gentlemen from the Blackfoot tribe, and fell in love with them. Their structure, their bone structure and everything, he started sketching them immediately. He said, I want you guys to model for future statues that I've got in mind. And he, he did a lot of work with the Blackfoot eventually. So in 1896, they went back to Paris because he had gotten an extension on his scholarship, the Reinhardt Scholarship, to study in Paris and do additional work. Well, the next year, 1897, they had a daughter, uh, Hester, that was born in Paris. This is Proctor's small studio with their, their brand new daughter, Hester. She was born there. Okay. In 1898, they had to go back to New York because his scholarship had ended. <laughs> so he went back to New York, but he got a commission to do a statue for the International Exposition in Paris in 1900. So he went back to Paris to do that work. <laughs> okay. Then they returned back to the States, but not before their son was born in 1900 in Paris. So now they had two children, their first two children that were born in, in Paris. Okay? But by 1901, they had to come back because now Proctor was going to have an exhibit at the um, Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. I mean, it just, this is how they went back and forth all the time for these commissions. Uh, they moved a couple of times in the New York area and finally ended up back in New York City because they got an apartment near the Bronx Zoo because Proctor had gotten a commission to do different animals for different buildings that they were building at the Bronx Zoo. Here's one of them for the elephant house. They, he did the monkeys for the monkey house and, and he did seven different buildings for them at the Bronx Zoo as they built them. Okay? Well, by now, Hester was growing... I'm sorry? Those are all still there? Almost all of them are. Uh, two of the monkeys uh, were removed uh, about 25 years ago. But other than that, to my knowledge, they're all still there. Um, Hester was now growing up, a little girl, but she learned to speak French. So she was trying to learn English back in New York. And she wanted to repeat what her father would say. His term for his wife was my dearest or my lovely. Well, Hester was trying to say, Mommy, dearest. And it came out as Modi. It was a nickname that stuck the rest of her life. Everybody after that called her Modi, except Proctor. He would every now and then, but not very often. Normally, he called her Margaret or my dearest or my lovely. Okay. <coughs> Their next son was uh, born in New York City. Uh, he was named Bayard Proctor after his dear friend Bayard Craig. Uh, uh, several years later, they had moved to an area in northern uh, New York, Indian Hill, just outside of Bedford, New York. Proctor called it my ranch. He said he could boast that at the highest point of the land, it commanded a view all the way back to my Rocky Mountains. Because he never stretched the truth. 
New York to the Rockies, okay? But they did live on a little bit of a hill. Uh, his family called it the world of magic and fun because Proctor had his studio out in the backyard, but they also had a little building that they would put plays on for underprivileged children out of New York City. They would bring them up and, and put plays on. Modi would make a bunch of costumes and the kids would all be involved in it, okay? Well, this is Hester with another one of the young Proctor children, and that's Proctor's studio at back. Never mind the diapers hanging on the wall, on the uh, line, but out here is a little metal wire cage. In that cage, Proctor kept Cossack, a mountain lion, or a cougar. Supposedly, Buffalo Bill had gotten permission to lasso this mountain lion in Yellowstone National Park, and Teddy Roosevelt gave him permission to loan it to Proctor to sketch and do art with. Okay? So Proctor started sketching his panther, as he called it. He would come up with four different versions of the stalking panther. And at the end of the program this afternoon, um, I will invite you to come up. And behind the projector there is one of Proctor's stalking panthers. That is version number four. That is the one that Teddy Roosevelt's uh, um, cabinet bought him later. They bought a big one from Proctor and, and gave it to Teddy Roosevelt uh, as his, when he left the presidency. I'd like to read again from his autobiography. He wrote, my working habits would have made life a problem if my wife and children had been less understanding. One Christmas Eve, a composition of an Indian pursuing a buffalo popped into my head. On Christmas morning, I was up at daylight and had a fire going in the studio. Quickly, I made an armature, the wire uh, bracket, and settled down to work. At noon, Margaret brought Christmas dinner to the studio and left it on the steps outside. By five o'clock, the sketch was all finished. It was a lost day as far as the festivities were concerned, but a valuable one to me. Did I mention he was also independent? <laughs> Another picture uh, around the ranch, just the family continuing to grow. They eventually, uh, you'll hear that they had eight children eventually, but, but uh, again, uh, in the New York area. And then he went to Princeton because he was hired to do the Princeton Tigers. They started, most of his sculptures started out, outside. They have since moved a number of his uh, Tigers indoors in, in different halls throughout the, the university. About that same time, in 1902, a major renovation had started at the White House with Teddy Roosevelt. They were redoing a, a lot of the White House. It, it needed a lot of work. By 1909, they had gotten to the, uh, the main dining hall uh, in the, uh, the White House, and Proctor was contacted, not directly by Teddy Roosevelt, but he suspected Teddy Roosevelt had a lot to do with it. They wanted him to work on the mantel over the fireplace in the main dining room. He did a bas relief of a buffalo head. It's hard to see in this picture, but it's right here. Uh, that whole thing there is above the mantel in the White House. That's a Proctor work. Stayed there for, for many, many, many years until the Trumans did their renovation of the White House in 1952. At that time, they took that out and put it in uh, Truman's, they saved it and put it in the Truman Presidential Library. Well, when Jackie Kennedy came into the White House, she wanted to renovate it and take it back to the way it had been originally, and the Trumans wouldn't give it back to her. They said, no, that's ours, that's, that's in our library now. So Jackie Kennedy had a reproduction done of it uh, matched it almost exactly, and it's in the White House to this day, okay? So, so he did know some influential people. It, it was very good for him because, yes, he did get paid for that. He and Modi decided to go out on a date night. They went down to New York City on a date, and she said, you know, we've been married for a number of years, and I've known you all this time. I've never seen you without a beard. He said, okay. So I shaved it off for her. It was, after all, a date night, something special for his wife. Went back home, and their young daughter said, who are you? Well, this is your daddy. Well, 
we have another daddy that lives in New York. <laughs> the kids saw him and then they didn't see him and they saw him and they didn't see him. But he would spend Christmas with them many times. Not always, but here's Christmas of 1912 with uh, all the kids and even a couple of neighbor kids in there. So, But um, his, uh, one of his youngest sons was also born in 1912. By 1914, he had taken off to work on commissions. Between 1912 and 1914, he had gone from Montana to Portland, Oregon, to Seaside, Oregon, and then back to uh, Portland, and then to Pendleton, Oregon, for the annual roundup. All of those times, uh, building statues and sm small works for some of their universities and stuff like that. Well, he would take a trip with the with kids and the family every now and then, but most of the time, he'd take off and do these, I'm going to be gone for four or five months, take care of the kids. And, and Modi would stay there and take care of the kids and the house and, and the books and stuff like that, and Proctor would be off. Finally, they, they tried catching up in Pendleton. But before Modi got there, Proctor learned that to, to really sketch the wild animals at the rodeo and the roundup, he needed to be close to them. So he would walk out into the middle of the arena with his sketch pad. And this is one of the many sketches that he did. He called this, the artist goes on high. <laughs> Afraid he was going to get run over. But that's how, that's how he did it. But this was during World War II, and he was one of the very few artists that could do enough work and stayed in, employed during World War I. It was very important to him. He sent a long telegram to Margaret asking her to bring the family out to Pendleton. And uh, she took two weeks, boarded up the house they were living in, subletted the studio that he had out back, got everything packed, and got on the train and headed for Pendleton, Oregon. Because the kids said they went to the Wild West and Indians to see Daddy's West. We're all going to be scalped. Hope Daddy can protect us. Well, a few weeks later, school started, and, and Modi had the children in, but one of their young sons, Bill, was enrolled in, in the first grade, and Mo Modi received a note from his teacher. She, in it, it said, do you have any reason why Bill fights with all the other boys every day before school starts? And of course, Mom, she, Modi, had no idea. And so she talked to him. Apparently, his older brother had egged him into a fist fight at the school the first day of school, and he assumed that's how every day at school was supposed to start. So he was picking a fight with somebody every day. So Mom finally put a, quickly put a stop to that. I mentioned earlier that Modi was an artist, and she'd almost given up all of that. She would dabble in it every now and then. But this is one of her paintings that she did. Uh, this was a teepee. She did the teepee because they lived in it for about a month and a half. Okay? They were out in Oregon doing some sketching, and so they, this is the teepee that they actually lived in. They didn't have all the children with them then, just the four of them and, and a lady that helped out. So, you know, it was just one of those things that they did while they were moving around, wherever they had to. I, I'm not going to read, we're running a little bit behind, so I'm not going to read this, but it, it's just not that important. But this is Modi's mother. She came out to visit. Often in Pendleton, she, lo she loved the area. Well, when the first year they were there, he'd been working on a horse and a rider. And the family went down to southeastern Oregon um, to visit the ranch of Bill Hanley. Bill Hanley would become a, a U.S. senator from Oregon. And Proctor did write that he had come a long way from his mo Rocky Mountain days. When there was only myself to look after, that summer of camping at Hanley's Ranch was one of the most pleasant times the family ever had. But in 1915, he bent over and he had difficulty regaining his balance when he stood back up a couple of times. They diagnosed him with bleeding ulcers. He was in serious condition. The people in Oregon couldn't hardly begin to take care of him. So his mother came down from Washington, and she agreed to babysit with the children while he and Modi took off and went to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. 
The doctors there did surgery on him. They wanted to do a second surgery, and they said it won't do any good. He's not going to live through the second surgery. He's in really bad shape. Modi said, okay, don't do the second surgery. I will nurse him back to health. They got an apartment there in, in uh, Minnesota, and Modi spent the next two years slowly, carefully nursing him back to almost perfect health. Took really good care of him. And her mom was baby, babysitting this whole time. Finally, they were on their return trip back to Oregon. He'd received a couple of commissions, and he needed to get back to work. This was now 1917. They stopped in Denver on the way back to Oregon because another friend of his had passed away, Buffalo Bill. So he went to the funeral in the Denver area. It just happened that by now, a gentleman by the name of Teddy Roosevelt was the president of the Buffalo Bill Association fan club, if you will. Okay? Teddy Roosevelt asked Proctor to do a sculpture of Buffalo Bill. So Proctor sketched it up for him real quick that day and while they were talking about it. The sculpture doesn't exist. It never became a reality. They couldn't get the money together for it. Okay? However, he met with Mayor Speer at Denver, Proctor did, and Speer at that time was pro putting together his program that he called City Beautiful to increase the beauty and the art in the Denver area. So he drove around with Proctor for a couple of days and said, these two statues that are really almost down to their wire frame that you did in 1893, we want to replace them. Will you do some statues for us? And Proctor said, you bet. I'll do one almost just like them. And Mayor Spears said, okay, but we can't pay you. And Proctor said, okay, call somebody else then. Mayor Spear actually found two gentlemen, wealthy gentlemen in the Denver area, and they each paid for one of these uh, uh, statues that Proctor would do. Okay? Okay? And, and you'll see pictures of them here after a while when we, when we talk about it a, bit, a little bit more. So finally, Proctor's health was almost totally recovered. He was back in Oregon. Um, he found in Portland some, some more uh, people that would be, oh, you know, people he could copy and put on his horses and stuff like that. But with winter coming, they decided to leave Oregon. He wanted to continue his work, so they moved to Los Altos, California, and he rented a studio there. Well, Margaret rode the train down first to get the, the kids all enrolled in school, and then Proctor and Hester, who had stayed behind to take care of him, and his friend Alden, Alden Sampson, who had come out for the summer, they decided to go down to California. And I wish I had a picture to show you what I'm about to describe. Because Proctor made some kind of a contraption that he could make a roasting pan connected to the exhaust pipe so they could cook their vegetables and meat as they drove down the road. <laughs> Carbecue. <laughs> I wish I had a picture of it. but but. Um, but they lived in Los Altos for a while, and then they moved just a short distance away to Palo Alto in 1917 because the studio wasn't big enough for what he was working on. He and Modi had now been married for 24 years, and Palo Alto would be the first place they would stay in for more than five years. Proctor was 57 years old, and that's the first time he ever stayed in one place for five years. Okay. In 1918, uh, they celebrated their 25th wedding anniversary. There they are in their, their porch. Okay. Another daughter was born there in, uh, in uh, Santa Clara, right over the hill. But um, Pro uh, Modi was expecting another baby before she was born, of course. And Proctor had to go back to Montana for a commission. So he was working on this Indian for Denver and sculpting some of the Blackfoot and, and stuff like that, sketching. So Hester went with him to cook for him and stuff like that. Well, while he was working in his studio, she just wandered around in the forest and stuff. But the telegram came that the baby was due, but Proctor had put it all together. His, his statue was now in clay, so Hester had to stay in Montana and keep the clay wet while Proctor went to California for the baby. The baby was born, so Proctor went hunting. 
<laughs> went back to Montana, finished up his sculpture, and uh, got it all, all done uh, and ready to uh, be bronzed, okay? Then he went back down and, well, haven't you guys ever tried lassoing your puppy in the backyard? Oh, my goodness. He did have a great sense of humor, I think, okay? Uh, this picture of Modi was taken in 1919. I, I love this great portrait of, of Modi, okay? But, you know, the family never had a lot of money. And the ups and downs of the finances, because these statues that he was doing would make him a lot of money, but he only got paid every two or three years when he got done. So then he'd put that money out for art supplies and, and models and so forth and so on. And so they'd go from way up here and down here and way up here and way down here. So Modi took care of a lot of that and, and handled all of that for him. Okay? Sometimes he needed a little extra money, so he'd take fishing trips or hunting trips with some of his friends because some of them would pay him to be a tour guide. Some would just take him and go hunting, like Henry Stimson and Teddy Roosevelt. And, and uh, uh, there was a gentleman, George Pratt, the president of Sacconi Oil. Uh, I mean, on and on and on. Or sometimes he'd just take Modi fishing. He just said, let's go. She finally got more, and as the kids started growing older, she got more and more into outdoor, enjoying the outdoors with Proctor. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me again. Um, in 1920, Hester stayed up all night uh, over New Year's Eve. She taught herself how to shuffle a deck of cards. Her father would not allow the children to have a deck of cards because it would lead to gambling, and gambling was bad. So she sat up and taught herself how to shuffle a deck of cards. Okay? Finally, in 1919, the Bronco Buster was completed and placed in the Civic Center Plaza in Denver. And in 1922, On the War Trail was also placed downtown Denver. Uh, on the War Trail is the closest to you here, and back in the distance is the Bronco Buster. Okay? They are bronze. They still stand in Civic Center Plaza, downtown Denver. Uh, these now have Gothic columns about 40 feet in the air, but those statues are still in place. They didn't have the, the artist's name on the plaque. The plaques that were placed on them listed the names of the gentlemen that paid for them, but not the artist. That's how they got them done, okay? I'd like to read uh, again from his uh, autobiography. He said, I've been asked how sculptors get their ideas for statues. Most of my inspirations for statues or compositions come without apparent effort on my part. Sometimes a filmy image would just flicker in my brain for months or even years, and then suddenly appear clearly in my mind's eye when I least expected it. Are you okay? Do you need some water? Okay. <laughs> The pioneer mother came to me in that way. For many years, the desire to do a statue of a pioneer woman uh, had been strong and insistent, but the image was always vague. It seemed to me that most people in thinking of pioneers thought solely of the men. I considered the heroism of the woman equal to and perhaps greater than the men. As Mark Twain said, the women had to endure everything the pioneers did. And then they had to endear the pioneers. Whenever I speculated on, on a statue of a pioneer woman, I decided that I didn't want to show a, her doing ordinary tasks, plodding westward in a calico dress or driving cattle before her. I wanted to be true to life, but I also wanted to show an, another, no less heroic side. One night in 1922 in Palo Alto, I saw the statue at last suddenly clear and very distinct in my mind. My vision of the statue was a group of weary pioneers traveling westward over the plains. The young mother, the principal figure, rode horseback, carrying a baby in her arms. I called it the hope for the future of the West. Well, now it was time to move again. So they moved to Hollywood to continue work on the model for the Pioneer Mother and a couple other projects they had going on. But the Pioneer Mother would become too large for his studio. And so he said, well, I need to ship it to New York and, and reopen my studio back there that we had sublet several years ago. And I'll work on it there. 
He went back to New York and sent a telegram to Modi and said, you wouldn't believe how expensive it has become here. Everything is outrageous. I can't afford to live by myself, much less bring the family back. I have to keep renting the, the uh, studio out. I don't know what I'm going to do. And Modi said, well, why don't we go to Rome? Proctor was offered the use of the studio at the American Academy of Art in Rome. So they packed up again. <laughs> but his statues, the clay models and some of the um, shorter models, were in California. So they spent a month or two packing up and getting everything created, put it on a ship, and sent it around to Rome. Well, that gave them time to take a vacation. So they packed up everything in their car and they drove across the country for about a month, just taking a long vacation. They went back to New York and they were getting stuff all packed and ready to get on the ship. And they thought about it and they looked at it. And their first son figured that he shouldn't go to Rome with him. He was born in Paris. His parents had never registered him at the American consulate. He was considered a, a French citizen. When they came back to the States, he had never re-registered in the United States before he turned 21. He was still a French citizen. Had he taken off with them and gone to Rome, he could have been inducted into the French army. So he and his wife stayed in New York City. There were just a few things going on, okay? But then they, the rest of the family, or some of the family, went on over to Rome to start work over there. Okay? They actually were in Rome for two years. Here's some of the people visiting his studio. Uh, that is actually the King of Rome and the American ambassador. Uh, excuse me, not the King of Rome, the King of Italy. Um, and the ambassador from the United States walking up to the studio to visit with Proctor. Okay. King Emmanuel and his wife and the ambassador visited. There's the ambassador with Proctor. Uh, and the bas relief that you see, this is very similar to the one that's in the White House now. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a sheriff that he did for Oregon. That's actually his model. The, the statue is quite larger. And this is the pioneer mother back here in the background that he was working on and, and getting it all in there. Okay. While he was there, a gentleman from Oregon that he had known came to visit. His name was Campbell Church. He had met their daughter, Nona, in Oregon. And he traveled all the way to Italy to say hello. And invited her to come back and attend the University of Oregon with him. And she did. And they, of course, would fall in love and, and get married. But, but um, So Proctor worked on that. The pioneer woman was finally cast and getting ready to be bronzed and everything. So it was time to move again. They moved to Brussels to get away from Mussolini. Just on the go constantly. Finally, after five years, the pioneer mother was unveiled in Kansas City, Missouri, where it still stands today. Uh, as usual, most of the family was there. His unveilings always drew big crowds. But this one was, was uh, kind of special. Uh, th this one had all kinds of dignitaries uh, from the United States and many people from Italy that had visited his studio showed up there also. Okay. Um, he and Modi went back and, and this was another home that they had, or their original home, excuse me, in, in New York. And they spent some time there uh, because he spent the next 11 years moving back to Brussels once, and then he went to Winton, uh, Connecticut, and then to New York, back to Connecticut, and back to New York. In the fall of 1932, Modi became very ill. She was told she had a tired heart. By Christmas, she had pretty much recovered, feeling much, much better. So another commission was given from the Southern Women's Memorial As Association for a statue of Robert E. Lee. Uh, and a young soldier, they had placed it in Dallas during the centennial of the Texas, uh, they had, excuse me, let me back up, placed it in Dallas during the celebration of the Texas centennial. And this is how it turned out. There's Robert E. Lee and the young soldier. Okay. The car in front of that is Proctor's new car that he bought with a commission. This is a Lincoln Zephyr. He named the car Traveler. 
not because they moved so often. Traveler was the name of Robert E. Lee's horse. And Robert E. Lee's horse paid for that car. And that's how Proctor put it. So, okay, the, the part of the family and, and uh, people are there. But the unveiling of the Robert E. Lee statue was again a very important occasion. Actually, pre President Franklin Roosevelt unveiled the statue. And his only word, magnificent. Okay. Another commission was given to Proctor uh, after the Robert E. Lee. Uh, this was for the University of Texas at Austin. And so they went to Texas to study Mustang horses because his statue was going to be a group of Mustangs. So they went to a, a ranch south of Austin. And while they were there, Proctor, who's now 78 years old, he was working on, on these Mustangs. And Modi wrote a letter to some of her children that were, had grown and had families started of their own. She said, we were given a little unfurnished two-room house filled with cobwebs with a cement floor. The kitchen windows are simply holes cut in the siding with no glass. As you know, being on this ranch has been a dream of ours for years. So few have the opportunity, and one can easily see why. It would be overrun if not closely guarded. <laughs> However, World War II was going on, and there was no bronze for statues. It was all going into uh, the military, of course. So they finished the, the model for it, and it sat for many, many years. Okay? So they decided to move back to the Northwest, first to North Bend, Washington, and then down to Seattle. In between commissions, Modi had gathered a bunch of material and papers and newspaper articles and all kinds of notes that Proctor had done and, and said, why don't you start writing about your life? He started by making some handwritten notes and finally got the, uh, a typewriter and started typing a little here and there and a little here and there. Well, in 1942, Modi's heart acted up again. Um, this time, Modi passed away. Proctor moved in with his daughter, Nona, and her growing family uh, in Oregon. Uh, and her older daughter, his older daughter, Hester, came to live with him. And so they moved back to North Bend to be on their own. She started helping him, and she started typing some of his stories that he had handwritten. But he would complain to her. She didn't type very fast. She said, well, I want to remind you, Father, that you would not allow me to take typing in school because you said it would lead to me sitting on my boss's lap. <laughs> that was her excuse to not type very fast. So, okay. But at Christmas time in 1942, uh, this picture was taken uh, at, back at Nona's house. Uh, this is her children. Um, the young man sitting on Proctor's lap uh, is his son, his grandson, Alexander Themister Church. Campbell Church that visited him in Italy. This is his children, okay, with Proctor there. Nobody likes to say they have a favorite grandchild. Proctor announced to the whole world that this young boy was his favorite grandson. No question about it. That man is, has a nickname. His, his nickname is Sandy Church. He is a dear friend of mine. A number of years ago, Sandy uh, inspired me to put this program together. I've known Sandy for about 15 years now. Just a wonderful, wonderful man. Okay. Well, on the move again, Proctor decided he wanted to go back to Palo Alto and live down there for a while. So in 1944, he and Hester moved to California. And he went back to Oregon and picked up one of his grandsons, not Sandy, but a, a different grandson when he was 14. And he said, let's go hunting. So he took his 14-year-old grandson to Alaska to go hunt caribou and bear. When Proctor was hunting there, the guide that they had with him said, your gun isn't big enough for the big bears here in Alaska. He said, I'll try and make do. Killed a caribou and a bear in one day just like he had done in Grand Lake so many years before. Okay. Finally, after uh, in 1948, the Mustangs were cast in bronze and they were uh, put into Dallas, uh, but Modi would never see him, the last work that he had ever done. Proctor said, my friends used to say that until I married in 1893, I rarely slept in the same bed twice. 
Even with marriage, few of my habits changed much. When I was off on a hunt, to toting about 40 pounds of guns and ammunition, I'd wish, though I'm not sure the wish was genuine, that I could settle down like most other humans and not be eternally chasing about. Before I married, I never argued with my guns. When they said it was hunting time, off I'd go. After the children began arriving, my old shooting irons would often give me the message and sometimes I'd have to say, can't go this time, boys. Have children and a wife to, to help. Well, Margaret used to tell me that she always knew when hunting season was approaching. In my sleep, I'd start shouting, I got him, I got him. When the urge was more than I could bear, Margaret would smile and I'd be off hunting. Eventually, some of the hunting and fishing urge rubbed off on Margaret. I was born during the frontier period of the United States and grew up in Colorado in the best part of it. It colored my life and influenced me greatly. I would not change my life for any other, but my love has always been deeply divided. I am eternally obsessed with two deep desires, one to spend as much time as possible in the wilderness, and the other to accomplish something worthwhile in art. With a fine wife as inspiration in my work and as companion in the wilderness, with a fine family of children and with good friends, my cup has been full to overflowing. It is now September and the hunter's moon is up. I must put my tools away and get ready for another hunt. After that, I'll get back to work. Alexander Femister Proctor passed away on September 4th 1950, just days before his 90th <coughs> birthday. Their daughter, Hester, wrote the introduction to his autobiography that she named Sculptor in Buckskin. She wrote that her father had a wonderful sense of humor and a delightful twinkle in his eye. He could always be counted on to say yes when the kids would get a no from their mother. To all his children, he was consistently kind, generous, and affectionate. She wrote that one of the boys had written, I would rather belong to this family than to have been born a prince. So who was the sculptor in buckskin? Alexander Femister Proctor. His life was his art. His living was the love for his wife, his family, and hunting in the West. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>